Okay, so we are very excited and happy to have um, our CISA partners with us today. And our first presentation, as Vincent mentioned, we'll have two from CISA. And the first one is uh, Robert Dew is our speaker. And he's the Senior Technologist Advisor for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. He's responsible for the overall technical development on design, development, testing, and deployment of priority and interoperability of uh, next, genera next generation network priority services, including government emergency telecommunications service and wireless priority service. He's also responsible for technical advisement on the transition of 5G and technologies for data across Internet of Things for public safety. Um, he has over 20 years of experience in wireless telecommunications, and uh, we're very excited to have him here today. So I'll turn it over to him. pointer here. Okay, good. Yeah, so as Vincent said, and I got it introduced, yeah, I'm a senior technologist advisor with the Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, we became an operational agency in November last year. Uh, the primary mission of CISA is really to protect America's critical infrastructure from physical and cyber threats. Uh, and I'm particularly, uh, I'm mostly due in the emergency communications division, which uh, Vincent put up in one of the, uh, one of the charts earlier. Uh, next slide. Oh, do you want me to advance it? Oh, okay. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, as this is the customer for DHS and T, our customers really are public safety and national security and emergency preparedness personnel. And one of our big priorities in emergency communications is making sure that voice, video, data is interoperable and prioritized at an event. Uh, you have very big events that happen in the United States. You have a Virginia earthquake. Obviously, the Boston Marathon happened here. Uh, school shootings, that sort of thing, where a lot of different agencies and jurisdictions have to respond, law enforcement, EMS, fire. And they need to be able to exchange data and make sure that their voice, video, and data is interoperable, as well as their communications are prioritized. So it's a very difficult ecosystem that we're dealing with. Um, we can have interoperability between wireless broadband, land mobile radio, Radio, uh, alerts and warnings, NG911, any sort of network device, communications, or system that public safety and NSEP personnel use, uh, we are really like the national leader in collaboration on those, those efforts for public safety and NSEP users. Uh, so a lot of the things that we do at, at CIS and the Emergency Communications Division is at a national level, we have the National Emergency Communications Plan, which uh, is currently, we're going to be bringing out the 2019 version of it, 2014 is up there. Uh, it is under public comment, it's currently being reviewed. This is kind of like the North Star for emergency communications for the nation in terms of governance and best practices. We also engage a lot at the state level with statewide interoperability coordinators. We work with a group called SAFECOM. SAFECOM is, is a group of public safety users that we meet with twice a year. We have working groups throughout the year to try to get what are the needs for public safety and how can we help them operationalize the technologies out there for interoperability. We also work with the National Council of Statewide Interoperability Coordinators, which these individuals at the state level are responsible for coordinating all the emergency communications in their state. We do a lot of technical assistance and training and exercise with public safety, so we deal a lot with the federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial uh, levels in the United States. Uh, so three of the services that I'm in intimately involved in is uh, the Government Emergency Communications uh, Service, the Government Emergency Telecommunications Service, Wireless Priority Service, and the Telecommunications Service Priority. Uh, GETS and WPS provide priority to NSEP and public safety personnel when the wireless networks are congested so that they can get their voice calls through and across carriers. There's 29 wireless and wireline carriers. I'm sure you're very familiar with them. We have all the large nationwide uh, wireless carriers involved in this. Uh, the telecommunication service priority is when there is damage to network and circuits go down, this is a service that prioritizes restoring those circuits that NSEP users need after an emergency. So there's a lot of things we do in governance. 
uh, and guidance and best practices for public safety. Uh, we work a lot with DHS and T in doing R&D and the technology that's out there and operationalizing it for public safety and NSEP users. But we're also the operational agent for these services uh, that have been in existence since uh, sub September 11th, and uh, GEPS was even in existence uh, prior to that. Okay, so I'm going to go a little bit over a 5G overview. I think a lot of the people in the audience probably understand a lot of what 5G is in terms of the core, the applications, the RAN. I'm going to try to go through this pretty, uh, pretty fast, but I want to make sure that you understand kind of the complexity and the ecosystem that we're dealing with. And this is what, where we're coming up with these impacts, both positive and some that we have some concerns about for public safety and NSEP users, and why we're really looking to work with DHS and T and industry to help us close some of these gaps. So a lot of the vision for 5G that's up here was uh, put forward by a lot of early visionaries in 5G, like Dr. Ted Rappaport at New York University, who was actually out in Manhattan doing measurements at 28 and 39 gigahertz to actually prove that 5G could be deployed for fixed wireless access and mobility. So some of the key tenants or pillars I see of 5G is a demand attentive network. This is a network that can look at the users and applications where they are and can elastically respond to those needs, provide priority latency, throughput, uh, exactly where it's needed depending on what the user's doing and where the user is. It's also pushing a lot more processing to the edge of the network. Instead of taking all this information, bringing it into the core, processing it, there's going to be a lot of edge computing and processing that can be done at the edge of the network, which I think is really going to help with security and helping to prioritize communications and getting a very good baseline of what the network normally looks like during busy hour from uh, traffic and signaling and then what it looks like when there's congestion or potential anomalies. Um, advanced spectrum sharing, uh, there's a lot of talk about dynamic spectrum sharing going on right now, so the ability to use different technologies in, in, uh, in various frequency bands. Uh, there's going to be a lot more spectrum that we're going to be able to use. We're going to have, be able to do a much more of a heterogeneous network design with multiple site types, multiple frequency bands, and multiple radio access technologies. 5G is, is really, uh, it, it is about the new radio in RF, but it's also an umbrella uh, that can sit over, I mean, Bluetooth, uh, LTE still going to be here, satellite. Uh, so it, it, it uses multiple RF technologies going back to eventually the same 5G core. Obviously, the data rates are going to be going up very high. We've had megabits per second in LTE. Now we're going up another order of magnitude of gigabits per second. We're reducing the latency from 10 milliseconds on the air interface, trying to get it down to one millisecond. And in terms of the convergence of fiber and wireless, you know, I'm going to show an example design in Portland, Oregon that shows a lot of 5G everywhere, but we know 5G is not going to be everywhere in terms of the millimeter wave 5G. You maybe see 5G at lower bands like T-Mobile 600 megahertz band, uh, but 5G millimeter wave with extremely high throughputs is not going to be everywhere. It's really going to be in areas where uh, the public tends to congregate and in dense urban areas, or it could be more in rural areas and suburban areas as well, but it'll really have to be focused where people are because it's very expensive to deploy it for ubiquitous coverage at, at millimeter wave bands. And I think some of the use cases everybody knows, I mean, HDTV, immersive gaming, augmented reality, virtual reality, autonomous vehicles, smart cities are a lot of the things that are driving the need for 5G. Um, I think I'm going to skip this just due to time, um, but I want to talk about the last bullet. One of the things that we're really concerned about is, you know, in, in, in 3G and 4G networks, you had these kind of purpose-built hardware boxes that did a very specific thing. And what we're doing now in 5G is we're talking about logical functions and we're taking those hardware boxes and we're breaking up into software building blocks, which is very good in terms of the network can be much more elastic and reactive, uh, but it also has a lot of complexity in terms, uh, in terms of security as to where functionality is in the network, um, where it's not really physically located in one place, it's really more of a logical uh, in instance so I want to talk about a little bit about the need for 5G, like why are we going up to things like millimeter wave band? Well, the, these are the 28 modulation encoding schemes in LTE, and this is a link curve, so a lot, of the, a lot of wireless vendors use this to determine what sort of signal to interference and noise ratio they can handle and what modulation encoding scheme they can provide, which is ultimately your throughput or your cell spectral efficiency, how many bits per hertz can you do in a certain area. And with the frequency and time resource blocks we've got in LTE, we've kind of hit about 75 to 80% of Shannon's limit. 
And what, and what happens in LTE, so you've got coverage and you design for coverage for a certain cell edge, uplink and downlink minimum throughput, but to increase capacity in a coverage area, what, what carriers do is they site densify. So they start packing more and more sites into a coverage area. Now the issue is when you've got the same frequency band and especially at lower bands, what happens in, L, in, in 3G, what we saw was that the interface, so this, this right here is the number of uh, cell sites that you have. And this is basically the probability that you're meeting a design sine R, which is related to loading, which is obviously related to your throughput. Here's sine R and here's throughput. In 3G, we usually saw you add more and more sites to a certain area of coverage to increase capacity, and your sine R starts to kind of level off. So you're basically, you're adding more sites to an area, you're meeting more network demand, but you're also increasing interference in that area. What I've seen with a lot of the small cell designs that I've done in 5G or, and 4G moving forward is that when you start putting more and more sites in, you're, you're increasing your, your, your sign R and you're increasing throughput, but actually what happens is you hit a tipping point where you start adding more sites, you're actually doing a disservice to the actual sign R design, and, and I'll show this in a little bit. Even though you're, you're, you're giving more capacity for the network demand, you're actually increasing your interference. And there gets to a point where you do a trade-off, especially at lower bands where LTE operates below 6 gigahertz in the United States, where you really can't add any more sites. So what we need is we need more spectrum, and we need to go to frequency bands that are higher that don't cause so much interference. When you go up to millimeter wave and you start doing smart beam forming, you can put multiple beams on a user using massive MIMO smart beam forming where a sinar starts to go away is an issue and you're really dealing more with the noise floor. Now granted, this, the, the distance between a user and the site gets much smaller, which is why you need more sites, but you get away from the sinar problem you have in lower frequency bands. So to really get the gigabits per second throughput that we need in the low latency and moving to millimeter wave bands, uh, we really need that extra uh, higher frequency and more spectrum that's available at that higher frequency. So here's just an example. I just pulled Verizon. This was a, a frequency band chart I did. Um, this is their, 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 basically their 4G holding. So they've got, if you go in most urban areas with carriers like Verizon and AT&T, you'll see about 50 by 50, 60 by 60, 65 by 65 megahertz, which is a lot of spectrum. But when you look at their millimeter wave holdings, you can see in even just one millimeter wave holding, you've got 850 megahertz. So when you start moving up to these very high uh, frequency bands into the millimeter wave band, you start having gigahertz of spectrum available to you, and that's how we're gonna be able to get these very high throughputs. So this is a drive test that I did in a rural county in Minnesota, and the, and the point I wanted to make here, and this is a, this is a lake, is that coverage is really dominated by the lower bands. Um, it's really dominated by, uh, T-Mobile didn't have their 600 megahertz up at the time I did this, but you really see like AT&T, the Verizons of the world, are really dominating coverage in the 700 megahertz band. And those bands are gonna be there for a long time. Uh, so we're really, these are the type of bands where you can do 5G on them, but you're, re you're really not gonna be able to get the very uh, high throughput that you want. And you're not gonna be able to have that high throughput everywhere. It's gonna be in dense urban areas. Uh, so, the way I've seen uh, heterogeneous network and small cell design go from 4G moving into 5G is that it's very, th the biggest issue is to look where the population is actually, not just with census data, where they're living and where they're working, but actually where are they congregating during the day. And this is why you have to start looking at social data and take data from places like Twitter, because you actually see where do people cluster during the day. If you look at how many people live in Manhattan versus how many people come into Manhattan during the day, it's a very big difference. This is, this is Grant Park in Chicago, and for small cell design to increase that cell spectral efficiency and put the site as close to the users as possible, you've gotta have a good social intensity heat map, and you've really gotta put those sites dead center where the population is. And this is how the carriers are gonna make a lot of money. Uh, this is how they make their money and how they're gonna to have to do their 5G designs. And we care about this with public safety because we want very good communications in area where loss of life is most likely to occur. Uh, so this is just showing kind of a het net design. In the upper left-hand corner, you've got macro cells, and this is your cell spectral efficiency. And what you want to do is increase that cell spectral efficiency as high as possible because you're putting more throughput to where people most likely are, are, are located uh, per square meter. And when you start doing a het net design, which we're seeing, we've, we've seen now in 4G, and we're going to see a lot of that in 5G, is you start putting pico and femto cells, you're not only increasing the cell spectral efficiency, 
uh, you're also taking those macro sites and you're moving them farther along the grass. So this is how you increase your cell spectral efficiency is by using different cell types and different frequency bands. Okay, so for an optimized design in LT and moving into 5G, some of the key things that I usually look for are very highly accurate terrain data. In 3G and even I've seen in 4G design, they could kind of do maybe 30, 40, 100 meter uh, terrain values. Well, now when you get to sites that are gonna be covering tens of meters potentially, you know, your terrain bins need to be down in the centimeter uh, size. So you need highly accurate terrain data and you need highly accurate above ground clutter data, uh, which we usually use LIDAR data for. And as I showed previously, you need uh, uh, social intensity heat maps to make sure that your designs are very accurate, but you're also putting the designs where they're most needed. Uh, so this was a design I did in the Citizen uh, Broadband Radio Service, a 3.5 gigahertz. And what it shows is that for fixed wireless access, this is the number of base stations you need. And the, and the number of CPEs that you have are here. And for fixed wireless access, about 22.6 sites was ideal for this design I did it. It was in Loudoun County, it's a suburban county outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, but for mobile coverage inside those buildings, and, and here's the buildings and here's the coverage, uh, about 28.7 sites was optimal. And this is actually a real design, and it was a 20 megahertz channel in the CBRS uh, band. And the point I'm trying to make here is, the more sites you jam into an area, you actually start losing your efficiency in terms of your, your payback. So really, you can only cram so many sites at lower bands into a coverage area before you start having a lot of interference. Uh, and this, I don't know, can you play that video off there? If you go down, it's like, like the radio buttons like right here. This was, the, the, the reason we didn't do a lot of beam forming in lower bands in LTE is because you can see this was below six gigahertz if you just hit the arrow there. Uh, and you can see what happens is that because the beam forming's so wide and you get these side lobes, the reason beam forming was hard to do in lower bands is that you're spraying RF everywhere and as you're moving that beam around, that's great for that one site for coverage, but then you're blowing away the adjacent site right next to it. And the reason beam forming works so well in millimeter wave and higher frequency is because the beam widths are much tighter and they don't cause that interference with each other. Uh, so I've talked a lot about the RAN, the RF side of it. Uh, in terms of the 5G core, what's really changing is, again, we're going to network function virtualization, software-defined networks, uh, and we're moving, we're, gonna, we're starting out right now where we've got a 4G E node B and we're adding a 5G radio, and a lot of this has been done with the, with the carriers with fixed wireless access, but it's still going back to a 4G core. So eventually you want to get to the point where all the radios are going back to this 5G software core. And this, is, and this is the area where there's going to be a lot of uh, performance issues that are going to be fantastic, but where we get into a little bit of uh, concern in terms of security. Uh, so this is basically just showing that in 5G, the, the services are, and software is being disaggregated from the hardware. And you're, doing, you're having this avail uh, ability to do this thing called network slicing now, where you can logically slice across your RAN core and your transport network to provide very specific priority and security features for a specific type of, of group of users or group of devices. And ultimately, what we would really like to see in terms of priority services, like wireless priority service, uh, is to actually have network service as a slice for a specific group of public safety users, NSEP users, that need special priority in a congestion event during a network for the, for the network to have that ability to be able to slice across the network and provide them uh, low latency prioritized signaling and traffic when they need it. The other thing that we're also looking at as well with this network slicing and talking between the RAN and the core is, depending on what type of application they're doing, you want to put them on the right site type and the right frequency band. If someone's doing a voice call and they're in a car, you don't want to move them up to millimeter wave bands where you've got beam forms on street poles trying to follow them. You want that on current LTE, you know, 700 megahertz, something below six gigahertz because it provides wide coverage and it's only like maybe 33 to 40 kilobits per second voice. But if they're nomadic and they're having to pull down building plans or they're staged in an area, let's say, outside of a school shooting, then you may want them to have some video and high-speed data. Then you may want to put them on millimeter wave. So the network needs to know who the user is, what their priority is, what radio access technologies, frequency bands, and site types are available to them, and ideally put them on the right physical resource for that user, for the application that they're trying to do. 
so the first three network slices that we're seeing uh, and, and massive IoT will be coming out on like release 17 from 3GPP is um, the enhanced mobile broadband to have very high speed broadband, uh, the ultra low latency for stuff like industrial control for like autonomous vehicles, and then obviously massive IoT, which is coming from all these IoT, these tens of billions of connections we're gonna be having in the next five years. I'll go through this quickly. This is just the latest chart from the Ericsson Mobility Report that came out uh, uh, last month. Uh, but you know, you can see that we're up to 22.3 billion connections by 2024, with a comp uh, compound annual growth rate of about 27% for wide area and short range, 15%. So the point is, there's a, there's a connection density coming in 5G that from a security point and an attack vector point of view, we have not had to deal with before. Uh, so this is for smart cities, for vehicles in smart cities, this is just making the point that the design has to be very accurate down to very small bin sizes because now we're dealing at a much smaller footprint than we were with like macro sites. We really want to deal down to the sub-meter accuracy when we're doing 5G design. Uh, so some of the key issues that we're dealing with in 5G, one is coexistence. So there's, so, you know, we've had like, uh, uh, power companies being on SCADA systems. We've had public safety having land mobile radio. Well, now everything's coming together in LTE and moving to 5G. So you've got a lot of utilities, public safety, NSEP, a lot of prioritized users that are coming on to the same technology, the same frequency band. Uh, we need to manage priority and preemption. Who, who gets priority uh, in what case? And that's not even including all the IoT that's going to be coming about. So how do you separate human-based and prioritize uh, communication from IoT? And it's the same thing with security. Um, flexible mechanisms to enforce relative priority. So the network has to be very smart to know who's doing what, when, and what rights they have. And it needs to be able to do that very quickly. And it needs to be able to take that feedback from the edge computing going on at the edge of the network to make those decisions. Uh, a lot of the issues with priority are gonna be even more complicated by a different traffic profile that you might have. You may have a robot that's going in and doing um, reconnaissance uh, in a building that's collapsed that may need high speed video. And you're gonna have to be able to prioritize at the site users that were getting very high priority. Now they're gonna have to give up some of their bandwidth potentially for this video service. Uh, so it's, get, it's, it's getting much more complicated in terms of the priority, the preemption and the security of how you handle when a lot of different prioritized users doing different things are trying to use the same resource. Um, and then network slicing, obviously I talked about earlier, is you know, we really wanna see network slicing as a service and the ability to slice a specific type of user into a network slice and still keep that network slice secure and not allow um, someone to attack one slice to get to another slice. If you've got a device and you've got three or four network slices attached to that device, you don't want a user trying to get in, uh, uh, a malperformer trying to get in and have an easy slice to attack and they attack to that slice and then they can get to another slice. So you need the flexibility of network slicing but you have to be able to secure it as well. Um, access control is a big issue, like the network doesn't know what you wanna do ahead of time. So when you first come into a network, uh, an LTE, you're on the random access control channel and that's just basically a contention-based channel where you say, hey, I wanna do something and the eNodeB has to hear you, it has to resolve and get back to you. Then you tell them, okay, I have an establishment cause, I wanna do this, and then you tell them what network ID you have and all of that, but that first initial talking to the network right now really doesn't have a lot of priority and it's probably gonna need priority um, in 5G with autonomous vehicles because they need very low latency. So that initial ratch, that kind of congestion-based channel, uh, we're gonna have to uh, wrestle with that for priority and security as well. Um, let's see, uh, I think the rest of this, yeah, so these are just some more, some more of the issues. There's a lot of things we're gonna get in 5G, but because of the complexity, it's gonna take a lot more to, uh, to secure a lot of it. So I'm gonna move along. Can you, can you just pause here real quick? So what I'm trying to do with this Portland, Oregon example is to show you the scale of what a 5G network could look like and, and how public safety could be using it and, and why we need to make sure that it's secure. And it's, it's in, I tried to throw every buzzword in here. So it's got like sensors, it's got IOT, it's got millimeter wave, it's got network slicing, it's got HetNet design, but it's also a core network that's able to 
get an input which we'll show as an explosion on a sensor, and it's able to prioritize cameras in that area to give them priority to get eyes on the incident as soon as possible. But it's also showing a lot of the issues that are brought up with IoT, like you know, ubiquitous network connectivity, enhanced situational awareness, process optimization, and real-time response and control. So that's, I'm trying to show all of this in this uh, example design. You can play the video, thanks. Oh, okay, yeah, uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. So what I've done is I've pulled in all the light poles uh, in Portland, so there's like tens of thousands of them. They're, they're color-coded differently just depending on who owns them. So what we're gonna go through is look at the mounting assets that we're gonna put 5G devices on, and I'm choosing light poles. Uh, for that. So this is just um, zooming in and showing that. Uh, now, these, these sites here that you see are like three-sectored sites. These are macro sites that, that are in, uh, of one of the wireless carriers. So it's, a, it's, it's LTE coverage in like the 600, 700 megahertz band. What I've also done is I've pulled in uh, public safety hub sites because we may, from a fixed wireless access point of view, need to go from those light poles to public safety sites, to these macro sites. So, uh, so the kind of design setup here is there's no fiber to the light poles, so we have to do that wirelessly, and we ultimately have to get this traffic that we're gathering at the light poles back to macro sites which have fiber. And we're gonna use 5G millimeter wave fixed wireless access to do this. So I also pulled in all the building addresses uh, in the design area in Portland in case I needed to use buildings for temporary sites because you might not have line of sight from a street pole uh, directly to the macro sites. You may have to go to a building, you may have to go to a, uh, an intermediate hub site. Uh, so this is just showing the, uh, the building addresses there. So what I did is this was all done in an RF uh, tool, but I've pulled it into Google Earth so you can kind of visually see what's going on here. So as I talked about earlier, the social intensity heat map. So this is a social intensity heat map which is used to prioritize the 5G design. We want to make sure whatever light poles we're putting 5G nodes on, they're as close to where the public gathers and is most likely to be, which is good for public safety because that's where loss of life is most likely to occur. Uh, so you can see uh, the more red it is, the more intense, the more people are gathering. And this is just uh, going into a 3D view of it. Uh, so you can kind of picture it. It's, it's along the river there. Uh, I, I gave this presentation to a public safety group and we were at a Marriott in Portland. So I kind of centered the design around the, uh, the Marriott there. Uh, but this is along the water here. So you can see that hotel there is, is actually where I was giving it. And you can see that... Um, when I did the design, I used LiDAR data, so everything's accurate down to a submeter. The trees, the buildings, everything. Uh, so you, you can see that it's a, a lot of uh, intensity there in terms of where people are gathering. So um, again, just pulled into Google Earth. We, what we also did was a view shed analysis. We looked down at the light poles and made sure we had very good uh, uh, visual line of sight for the light poles as well. So when we're placing where we're gonna put 5G nodes on light poles, we're placing it on where people are most likely to be and where we have very good visibility and also where crime is most likely to occur. So I took like the last 10 years of, of crime in Portland and I said, we need to make sure that for public safety, you know, we have eyes on where crime's most likely to occur. There were dozens of different types of crime. Uh, I didn't weight crime differently, like murder versus larceny. We could do that, but it's showing you where crime is most likely to be. And it, it is usually where people gather. Um, but you can see, luckily for us outside the hotel, it wasn't too bad. Chinatown doesn't look so good, but uh, you know, it seemed pretty safe. Um, so, so I'm showing you the mounting assets and I'm showing you what drives where we put sites, which is where people are most likely to be uh, in crime intensity. What you can also do with this is also look at infrastructure, damage to infrastructure, uh, and natural disasters where they're most likely to occur. Uh, so this is showing the crime intensity with the, the hub sites that we're using. Um, and uh, if you could pause it just real quick here, sorry. Um, so, so what this is showing you is the, the connection of the sensors on light poles is by existing LTE, and this is the coverage. So it's very low latency. It's like a massive IoT design. You need a lot of coverage. You want it at a lower frequency band. So the sensors will pick it up on LTE. The 5G core network is gonna read it, and then the 5G core is gonna go out to the edge of the network and prioritize turning on these IP cameras. And we need uh, 5G throughput 
for, for IP cameras because if you look at like a body-worn camera a police officer might wear, if it's a 720p camera, it's recording about 5.5 gigabytes per hour, that's like five megabits per second. If you're at the edge of an LTE cell and you're trying to uplink that kind of video, and I've actually done a lot, I did quite a few video testing over the last couple weeks, you'll take all the resources of a 10 megahertz resource at that, that LTE. So we really need 5G throughput to stream video. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to make sure you understood. This is a coverage design, so it's going down the negative 120 dBm, which in LTE we call this RSRP. It's reference signal received power is how you determine coverage. Okay, so the design is showing all of the, all of the fixed wireless access links, and you'll see red, orange, and yellow. So I, I didn't go more than three hops because I want to keep the latency as low as possible. But this is connecting all the light poles that I prioritized based on that social intensity um, back through buildings, back to these macro sites. So I'm not saying that a wireless care is going to have a design this ubiquitous. So this is, a, this is a sample design. It's very accurate down to a meter, but this is to try to give you the scope of the issue that we're dealing with and how ubiquitous 5G uh, could be in our future in the next couple of years. And, and, you can, and you can see, I actually walked across the street, and you can see that yellow line. You could actually see right between the trees, and you had line of sight to the top of that Marriott. So it's highly accurate design. You know, you've got to have sub-meter accuracy to do this, because once you're in millimeter wave, everything's got to be line of sight. It's not like 700 megahertz where you're multipath rich, and you know, uh, signals are changing polarization and bouncing off buildings. You know, you, you can reflect those type of 700 megahertz off buildings. You'll get a lot of energy out of the second reflection. Not really going to be the case with millimeter wave. It really is line of sight. Okay, so sorry this is not an IMAX experience, but this is the best I could do in terms of a video. But this is actually out on the street in front of the Marriott. So this is doing the case of... Um, if, if an explosion happened and it got picked up by a sensor on that light pole, how would the core network have the, the, the RF uh, 5G network react? So, okay. This video goes a lot faster when you're by yourself looking at it too, but anyways. So here's the beam forming that happens off the light pole. So you can see the kind of coverage that you can get. And again, it's not like a fixed coverage like LTE where you got three sectors and it's sitting there. You know, it is beam forming around. So it's showing the area where you can actually beam form um, a signal. So you're seeing the mobility here, if you can see that red kind of painting out on the area there, and then you've got the fixed wireless access, which are the red, orange, and yellow lines. Now you'll see these green sticks, and you might be saying, what is that? That's actually the LiDAR height of the building. So when you bring the height from the RF tool and the LiDAR into Google Earth, you may see a little bit of a discrepancy, but the LiDAR, the, the green sticks are the accurate height. Um, and we actually, if you see that brown stick there, we actually found an error in one of the, uh, the cell carrier sites where they had it in their database. So, but anyways, this is just to try to show you the, uh, the kind of the ubiquity of a 5G design. Um, and I think, yeah, just to show you how, like that light pole there, for example, um, to show you it's actually physically on a light pole. I think maybe, I think we're good on the video. I'm probably gonna run out of time here in a couple minutes. So I just wanna get to, if we could go back to the, presentation. That's just showing one sitting up on a corner of a building to show you what it could actually see. Um, and if you could just go through, I think, the next kind of dozen slides there. Yeah, I have static slides in case for some reason the video doesn't work. Or I guess I could do it. I'm sitting here. Um, okay. Okay, yeah. So, um, and then this is, this one here is just kind of showing a, a residential design here down on the right, which is going to be a a big use case for public safety, uh, uh, for, for the 5G carriers. Okay, so the potential impacts of 5G. So, you know, the advantages is obviously the increased throughput, symmetrical uplink and downlink. We can now do a lot of beam forming. We can do massive MIMO. There's all these new technologies. It's gonna be a whole paradigm shift. Um, optimize special treatment of users. We can get much more granular with network slicing. We, we think these three network slices that are coming out, you know, it's probably gonna take a while for the carriers to transition from hardware-based and a 4G core sitting next to a 5G core, hardware sitting next to software and logical instances. It's gonna take a while to do these very granular, fine network slicing that we would need, but we do think it's coming in the next couple of years. Obviously, lower latency, moving from 10 millisecond to one millisecond. We need lower latency for industrial controls, things like autonomous vehicles and edge computing. And the one 
good thing about the edge computing is now you can do a lot of analytics at the edge of the network and you can look for uh, bad actors. You can get a good RF baseline in terms of what the sign are you're seeing so you know what kind of the network looks like during a busy hour. And if you start seeing very weird sign R values and all that, you know there might be someone trying to interfere with the network or do an attack. Some of the areas of concern, obviously, it's been in the news is like foreign development. I mean, one of the key issues in securing this 5G ecosystem is it's kind of like a four-stage thing. You've got the chipset manufacturers and the vendors and the OEMs. Then you've got how the wireless carriers deploy that equipment. Then you've got how they actually operate it ongoing. So, you know, when patches come in for devices, uh, th it's going to have to be an ongoing thing, how well they're logging and they're looking at their signaling and traffic and analyzing it for anomalies. Um, increase in order of connection of magnitude. So the phones are getting much more smarter. Uh, there's a lot more attack vectors than there were before. The connection density per square kilometer from going from 4G to 5G is increasing by an order of magnitude. Um, obviously, with much IoT devices coming on, what's the onboarding process of getting IoT on? You know, what are the, when you say bring your own device, uh, you know, that's how is that going to be secured? Uh, increase in small site density. Now it's on a light pole. It's more physically easier to get at than it would be on a macro site. Uh, we don't know that one entity is going to be able to provide a full 5G network. It may be a network of networks, so there's going to have to be trust between the networks. Um, integration with critical infrastructure we're going to be seeing, uh, falling back to other radio access technologies, taking someone in 5G, trying to drag them down to 4G or 3G, where it may be easier to break the encryption. Um, and increased complexity in modeling and testing. That's my problem. It's even harder to work on priority now with, uh, with 5G. And then, of course, the operations and maintenance. Uh, let me just see. I think I've touched on a lot of these things. I've got about a minute left. So, And you're, you're going to be provided these slides. So you'll see a lot of what our concerns are in terms of uh, the priority service spectrum sharing, security, um, and the provisioning. Even just things that aren't supposed to be errors could be errors. Um, you know, the wireless carriers have to get used to orchestration and network virtualization um, uh, in, in terms of big changes in their network. So it's, you know, they want to be more like Google's and, uh, and the Microsoft's of the world. And then uh, additional complexity with devices and IoT. So i sorry I blew through that fast. So I think I'll stop here. And is there time for questions? Uh, yeah, okay. So any, any questions? I know it's a lot, but... Uh, Right, right. I think so. So the good thing is with millimeter wave is that because you can do that very tight beam forming and massive MIMO, you really. Um, don't have so much of an interference issue as you had below six gigahertz. But there are going to be cases where uh, people deploying these systems are going to have to come up with a priority and preemption scheme of who's doing what when if resources do get congested. I think like in industrial controls where you could have like fiber uh, feeding a manufacturing plant and you've got 5G beam forming going on, that'll be more of like a closed environment. And that because of the beam forming, they'll be able to tightly control that RF to keep it from interfering with, let's say, autonomous vehicles on the highway outside. But there, even though we're getting a lot more capacity and throughput, I still believe there are going to be issues where we are going to run out of congestion or we might not have 5G capacity in an area and the carriers are going to have to work out with network policy with their enterprise customers, with government, how do you do that priority and preemption um, during, during, so that, there's, that they don't conflict with each other, especially with IoT? I know it's not a great answer, but these are just the things we have to work through. Um, the next, uh, oh, sorry, I think behind you there you had your hand up. Uh, light, are light poles better than uh, building roofs for uh, sites? It, so, as an RF engineer, I always say it depends. You know, it depends on that specific area. Like, if you're in, like, Pittsburgh or something, you know, you may do better with a building when you are San Francisco where you've got these streets going down. It really, so it's going to depend on having a highly accurate representation of the clutter and the morphology in the environment and doing good predictive RF analysis. 
Uh, street poles are going to get much closer to people in a flat area. The problem with buildings is, you know, you may not be able to form the beam way down. You might be, you've, even if you've ever noticed, if you're at a cell site, if you're like directly underneath it, you might not have very good coverage because the electric down tilt or mechanical down tilt of the RF is kind of pushed away from the site. It, it really depends. Most of what I've seen for good coverage of very busy streets, it's probably easier to get on the light pole. And if you can make an agreement with the owners of the light pole, you know, you can do better site implementation. If you have to go building by building, you know, it could be a long site acquisition process, but it, it really depends. But I think for, you know, 5G millimeter wave beam forming, if you're trying to get those nomadic, slow moving people on the street and for autonomous vehicles, I think light pole, light pole seems to be where everyone wants to get their, their, uh, their nodes. Um, sorry, I think you had a question. Oh, oh, so, sorry. Yes, on the um, edge computing side, I mean, of course you can network slice all you want, but on the edge computing um, side, what about the prioritization there? Um, and what about the prioritization in the, the, the larger internet? I mean, are we, are we gonna have internet fast lanes? Like, it has to be an end-to-end -end solution. I mean, the, 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 um, the last mile or the first mile is fine, but what about the rest of it? You make up a great point. So every, so when we do priority services, you know, we look at the wireless carriers, but you could give someone a priority service on a wireless carrier and they're trying to go to a server that's in some data center somewhere and they can't get the content, right? And they say, well, this doesn't work. Well, it did work. The problem is that's gonna be something that we have to work on with the, with the, the people running data centers and doing cloud services is that when that priority comes up to that fiber meet me room in that data center and has priority, it also needs to be extended to where those da data service is. But I'm hoping that the core networks will be smart enough that they will know what, what areas that they're touching in their network to network interfaces are congested and which ones aren't. So that if you have like an Akamai or you've got like some information that's stored on a server somewhere else or a secondary, it'll know to go to a less congested uh, place where that, that, that data is resident. But you're absolutely right. We can do it from the RAN, the core and the transport, but once you leave that 5G network and you go to the internet or you go into a data center, if you don't have priority there, you could have congestion if you've got a lot of people trying to hammer the same server. It's absolutely right. And I think that's one of the good things is why you want to try to unload and process whatever you can at the edge of the network, but there's obviously some where you just won't have that content available to you. Um, so, okay, yeah. So you talked about um, uh, the Internet of Things devices and um, se uh, defining uh, the priorities for each type of device. Is there some type of strategy in, in place currently where a device has some type of um, priority level, uh, depending on, you know, for one thing, it's the traffic for the priority, right, but right. the device itself, you, is there something in some scheme going on? Because I had a great plan for that, and it works on hierarchy, um, basically based upon a de, de, the design of the device itself sits into the hierarchy scheme, which are, gives it its priority within that network. So, so the way I think that it, it, it will probably end up working is you're going to have to have some of these IoT devices tied to some kind of subscription, whether it's human or not. Whatever USIM or eSIM goes in that device is going to have to have probably its access class or something set so that it has some kind of priority. But this, this is the beauty of not only having static priority in a network, but also dynamic. So uh, with, with public safety, they're going to need to have that ability to dynamically change some priorities on devices that they have subscribed to a carrier. So, for example, if um, you know, you've got law enforcement has like high priority on the network, but it's like a chemical spill and you want the hazmat team to be able to come in with video and sensors to have a higher priority, you'll have to have someone that's designated that can actually go in to a subscriber database or has some portal into that wireless network carrier and can actually temporarily uplift or change the priority for those hazmat users or those IoT devices that they make. But that's one of the big questions we have with security is what's that electronic signature of an IoT device that comes onto a wireless broadband network? Because you need to know who owns it, one, just for security, but also what's the network policy and priority that you treat that device with? So I think there'll be a static setting and I think the IoT needs to be set below the humans in most cases, but you need that ability to dynamically change it during an incident. Because um, you'll, never, you'll never be able to statically set priority for every user and IoT device for every single use case that, 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 that could come about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my question is related to the other two questions. How are you going to coordinate all of the various 
uh, carriers, both private and public, and users across all of these different issues, and then who is going to perform that coordination? Yeah, that's that, that's it. so. A lot of a lot of the security issues are being dealt with in 3GPP, like in release 15 and 16, in terms of security. But 3GPP doesn't is international, and that's what vendors build towards. But that's not necessarily what we may be looking for in the United States. So there's, I I predict. Um, I don't know what entity is going to have umbrella control over all of that. I know that for, for us, because we're the operational agent for like priority services, I mean, you can guess we would most likely be working with the wireless providers. Uh, we know what the specifications and requirements are in 3GPP and ADIS, which is like, you know, the, 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 the U.S. standards group for that. What are the gaps in terms of what are they deploying and what do we need and then we would probably have to work with them on that. I, I think that a lot of the security issues may go similar to what we dealt with with wireless priority service, where there were a lot of things built into the standards already. The equipment vendors had a lot of things, but they didn't have everything we needed, so we had to work with the carriers um, to enhance those services and find those gaps. Um, th there are different bodies that have different... Um, I'll say authorities for like for autonomous vehicles, for certifying IoT devices, uh, but I think with priority and security, it's probably going to be entities like DHS and that are going to be working with the carriers uh, to make sure that you know how they're doing their network slicing, how they're doing that policy. Um, we, we we can still ensure that public safety and NSEP users get priority in those situations. Um, I know that doesn't completely answer it, but it's a, it's a tough question. I mean, it's we, you know, it's, it hasn't been completely sorted out in LTE perfectly either. I think we're slowly learning as we're going along and making adjustments. So, um, I think we're done. Yeah, or is it? So we're sorry. I can. I'll be here. So. <laughs> Great.